That's what you now, don't I? This is the Black Rifle Coffee Podcast. Prepare to get caffeinated. You like to make dick jokes. It's something that you do, Marty Scovland. Dick poop. <laughs> you were the one that said the other night. It's a go-to, easy it dick poop like, joke. It's, it's the fallback. It always plays because there's a couple things in life that are guaranteed. One of them is death. Um, the other is pooping on a regular basis, and um, don't 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 poop shame people by saying <laughs> regular basis. <laughs> true, true. Because <laughs> that's been a really fun conversation that we've gotten into lately. Like. Mm-hmm. I don't care that you've been fasting for 72 hours and have gut well, issues. I gave you updates every but two hours. You did. You did. Yeah. Like, <laughs> going to keep you going on that. Black Rifle Coffee Podcast, ladies and gentlemen. I am joined by Marty Scovelin Jr. and Jamie Caldwell. We're out at the Black Rifle Coffee Ranch. If you're watching this on YouTube and you're wondering, like, why is there such horrific 60s wallpaper in well, the background? First of all, it's not horrific. It's beautiful. It's coming back. We're bringing it. It back. will never change. It will never change. This. I'll, I'll make sure that this wallpaper no. gets preserved until the end of time. Some things should never change. The Liberty Bell and this wallpaper. <laughs> it should never change. And and all the wonderful animals that we have behind Jamie. We've I, been. Uh, <clears throat> it's the middle of October. It's kind of the busy season for us here at Black Rifle Coffee, as there's multiple different productions in tow. We're starting new podcasts. Pretty soon here, Marty's gonna turn on the Black or uh, sorry, the Coffee or Die podcast. Yeah, in a little bit here, and then Jamie's doing a tow across the United States, kind of doing a bunch of training. And uh, he's like, "Hey, I'm gonna be in the area. Why don't I come through for a little bit?" I'm like, "That sounds like a great idea because I love it play. whenever you come and hang out because we always play with really fun toys. We typically drink really good booze, and they're." Maybe some hunting involved, typically. Uh, the only downside is you just have to put up with me, right? <laughs> he brings yeah, the good so, toys. So he, brings the, he brings you're, the good booze. Such but awful it is have around. Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> eh. if you're, and if you... Uh, we got these new Beyond Black bags, and I thought that was appropriate since we just got done filming a whole bunch of night vision stuff out at the range here in a little bit. So we did like some promos for... The new redesign on the Beyond Black bags, Uh, our guy over at uh, in Salt Lake there, Chris Hunt, who's a phenomenal illustrator, uh, doled up that one. We're doing a rebrand across the entire line of coffees, and we've got a couple more coming out later this year, but I think this is like number six. Because we're about halfway through the regular lineup about at this point, right? Yep. We still got... uh, AK-47 Oof, is I'm coming out. For that one. That one that looks really good. good. There's a little bit of a Sugar Skull situation happening there. It has like Sicario vibes yep. to it, which yep. I really like. Dia de los Muertos. Yeah. And then uh, we're still working on the murdered out one. So those are the, the other two that gotta that got to get out yet. I still remember when we saw that initial lineup last January, this earlier this year, and it was like, holy shit, if... We couldn't get any more epic with our branding. This is, I mean, this is it. Like, this lineup is amazing. It looks good. I remember Evan was like, I want you to, like, see the display of coffee bags and just be like, this is just, that's your first initial impression is like, this is the greatest coffee company that's ever existed just because their branding is so rad. It draws you in. You know, I mean, the bags when they first came out were great, but, you know, they all look the same, black, just white lettering or gray lettering. But now... I mean, you see them on the shelf and it does. You're like, what is that? And then all the images and this cool, the the same, the vibe that Black Rifle has. I mean, it just draws you right into, oh, look at that bag. I mean, there's some that I grab just because I like the artwork on the bag. I'm like, don't, that, don't that'll look good on my away. shelf. Yeah, exactly. You know? It's like fishing lures. They mostly... They mostly bring in and, and, and catch the angler because he's like, oh, that's a cool color. Like, I have to have that. Whether or not it's going to catch a fish or not, I don't know. But they sell a ton of it because the color looks cool, so... I literally don't throw our bags away. When I get done with them, I have like a file box that I just tuck them away into. It's just, I don't know. It feels like throwing away a piece of fine art, you know? Yeah. Is that that bad of a decision though to like pick a whole bunch of different colored lures and bait? 
Not really, but you know, I've gone back and forth because I, I have, I, I got caught up in the, all these different colors and and spending time doing colors, but now I'm back to like just pick five. I mean, there's staples in there, you know, for any of you guys that fish, like the green pumpkins, your watermelon, something like in a June bug or black with or blue, a black with blue flake. Um, you know, you want to have something in there with some chartreuse, but you kind of cover a lot of them just by having just those staples in there. And some of them are just good natural colors to have. But when you see a lot of, oh, that one's purple and blue and it's got this like green speck. And then that one's got the same thing, but blue speck. Oh, that, that might make a difference. There are certain times where little things like that do make a difference. But for the most part, bass, I hate to say that they're dumb because they have totally schooled me many a days out there on the water. Their brain is the size of a pea. And they literally are just lazy. They look at a bait or something that goes by and they go, eat or not eat, eat or not eat. And it's, do I expend more calories trying to catch that? Or is that an easy meal and I'll fill my belly because I don't know when I'm going to eat again. So as long as your bait looks enticing, they're going to eat it. Color, mm, not that big of a deal, in my opinion. But everybody well, has their no, own No, that's interesting. Because yeah. like you walk into Bass Pro and it's like, wow. It, it puts a 94 Crayola pack to shame. <laughs> do you have a lucky lure? Yes, I do. Well, tell me about it. I do, I do. There's my favorite lure, like lucky lure, is a Strike King 5XD in color 699. I'm going to geek out in here. No, go color for it. 699, which is natural shad. It looks just like a shad, but this bait, just the action on it is unique. I mean, it's tore up. Yeah. Like you could barely tell that that's the color anymore because it has caught so many fish. It's just one of those that you get them every once in a while. You come through some in a pack or you come through a certain bait that whether it's you just have a lot of confidence in that bait or that color, but something about it is just different. It's unique. It's special. But why is it your lucky one? Because I've caught a lot of fish on it. Just a lot. There's not like yeah. one that kind of sticks no. out in your head. It's just like... Not, not really. Um, I mean, there's certain baits that, you know, I've won tournaments on or have been really good. But like right now, that's the bait for me. It's And it's been for, it's been for over a year. I mean, I still have that one. I mean, there's been times I've had to go swimming to go get it because <laughs> yeah. I'm not losing that bait. But yeah, it's just, uh, it catches them. Would you say that you're a superstitious person? No, not really. I don't care about any of that. No. Like, I don't have any rituals. There's certain guys like, oh my gosh, I did great today in this tournament. You know, tomorrow's day two. I'm not changing my underwear, my socks, my clothes. I'm wearing the same thing. I'm sleeping in it and going, no. I'm like, man, I need no. a shower. <laughs> like, I'm stinky. I've been out there all day. Yeah. I don't care. What yeah, about you, I Marty? Just, I can't believe that we're just going to breeze right on by the fact that the Marine brought up a 94 pack of Crayolas and we didn't say <laughs> anything about it. 96. 96. Get your, I just want to acknowledge get that. Get your pack straight. It was a 100 pack, but it is a Marine. So now we're down to 96. Pretty soon we'll be See, back that's down to 94. That's what I was looking for. That's what we needed. Uh, no, I'm not, I don't think I'm too superstitious. I'm like a little stitious. Um, I know that's like a joke, but like I'm, there's certain things where I'm like, you know what? This certain way I've done something seems to have been working for a while now. I'm a big believer in if it's not broke, don't fix it. So uh, always try to improve your position, but don't, um, you know, don't try to just completely throw everything out and start from scratch if you don't have to. So there's certain things that I do that just seem to be working that I, I kind of stick with. But generally, like, do I not change my socks or underwear or only use one thing over another? No, I'm not. You know, I don't think about superstition on a regular basis at all. Yeah. Logan? I would say I'm like, I'm pretty, Yeah. Yeah, really? I'm pretty do, over do there. tell. Well, it started, it started during hockey, I think, going through the process of putting your gear on because there's so much freaking gear that you have to wear in hockey. And it, it it's a lot of time to just sit there and put shit on, right? Like later, like... And get inside yeah, your own head. Later in the other careers, right? Like, you you know, you have all your gear laid out and it like you can put it on in what, like... Seconds. Seconds. If, if everything's ready to go. This is like, it's... It's a process, right? Like it usually takes, like if you're flying, like it's going to take you about 10 minutes. Mm. 
And uh, so you just like, as you're doing there, but it's also like communal time with the team. So you're bullshitting a little bit. And it's just like, I was always very conscious of like, which pad went on first on which wit leg and then the skate. And then like the laces are going to be a certain way. And like, it was never like a washing situation, but it was just like, everything had to go on in a certain order. Cause you wanted that like routine built in the, in the pregame ritual. And, and then I think that carried over just, just like it just stuck with me in like weird little ways. Like I have a favorite pair of hunting pants. Like I, I yeah. call them my killing pants because like every time I wear, and if I don't wear them, like it, I just, I'm like, why, why am I being so shitty today? Yeah. Or like, why isn't stuff happening? And then I put those damn killing pants on and they get bloody. But and see, so, I, like, I just can't ignore little stuff like that. It's probably has it's probably one hundred percent false. But in motion just, tends to stay in motion. Uh, um, yes. you know, I, pants. So there, I see that in fishing. But it's if you have confidence in a certain bait, you fish it better. Like you're more efficient with it. You're paying attention more to what's yeah. going on with it. You know, you're like this bait catches them, whether it does or not, and the color is immaterial. You think it. So yeah. you're more in tune with what's going on. So let's just say possibly out there with your non-killing pants and you're stepping on rocks and breaking limbs and you're just not as cautious because you're like, I'm not going to kill anything anyway today. But when you got the others on, yeah. you're all stealthy. So, yeah. And it, it, does that make it kind of ipso facto? Those are the better pants then, right? Yes. Because like, yeah. mentally, the, yeah, the, mentally the, you're in the game. Is the better right. lure because you're yep. using it better. You're getting more out of it. Right. And if it... If it's helping you, if it's like getting you in that correct mindset, then it's kind of doing its job. Yep. And I, th- I mean, I'm guarantee you, everybody can relate to that. Yep. They got something that something that they do, and there's something they have more confidence in, or it's like, yeah, everybody can relate to that. Yeah. the The fishing lure thing is interesting because we we just sat down in the in the kitchen, and Jamie busted out this bottle of bourbon and the level of detail, like how you feel about bourbon and the amount of knowledge you have about bourbon is exactly similar to like, you know, specifically talking about Evan and his weird coffee nerdism and habits. But it also kind of speaks to like, I think especially guys who have done what you've done for a living, that personality type of like, I'm going to, if I really like something, I'm going to know, I can't help but know everything there is to know about it. And that also I've noticed across time that that's a habit of highly successful people is that what they are interested in, they're subject matter experts on. It's no surprise that Jamie was the best at what he did in the military and then found uh, and made it to an elite professional level in a completely unrelated field after he got out. And we were talking the other day about other guys he knows that are, you know, they get out and they are uh, leave the military that were at that level and then are now also at an elite professional level in another sport or another completely unrelated thing. And it's kind of one of those things was like, you know, Michael Jordan left the NBA and went and played in the MLB, you know, professional baseball. It's like people at that level, I think tend to, once they figure out what that magic, um, not that it's magic, but, you know, unlock that secret of like, oh, this is how you, you know, which is generally hard work, right? Like fucking hard work, don't quit, you know, a couple mm-hmm. of those things like, but they figure yeah. that out. And it's like, oh, if you just apply that to anything that you care about, you can then, a lot of times, I think, become extremely highly successful at that. Yep. You know, and I, I think that to to add to that, there is the time that you put into it. Um, so, for instance, very successful in my military career, but I did, you know, to get to that point. Look, I mean, that was that was say at about close to 15 years in is when I was, you know, I was already at the top level, but, you know, was I at the top of the top level, right? It Mm -hmm. took even longer of being there, learning more, going through, you know, more deployments and more situations that you see to really be like, when I was a team leader there, yeah. Like, I'm like, holy cow, like, I feel like I am at the top, like, throw anything at me. I've seen a ton of now situations and deployments and whatever, and I can figure it out. I mean, I, I absolutely, what I loved When I was a team leader, I loved when they would give us a mission. Like when we would get a target, it's like, hey, here he is. This is our dude. Here's the house he's at. Like there is no pre-planning of, okay, you know, he may go to this house, this house, and we have these plans on the shelf. Like that's not how we operated. It was, hey, he's here. We got to go now. And what I loved was just to look at it and say, all right, where are my helicopter pilots? Get them in here. Hey, can you put a helo here, here, and here? Yes. Yes. Let's go. 
the rest of it, we're going to figure out on the ground because that's what we do. But it happens in this But it took years and years and years to get to that level. So now I retire, I go fish, right? Now I'm fishing professionally. And I'm not going to lie, man, I was so mentally frustrated with not doing better in tournaments than what I knew I was capable of. Because I'm like, look, if if this was a target, like... I will figure this out in a heartbeat. Like I could get the bad guy. I know what he's going to do. I get there. I see what he moves and I know his next move and I'm ahead of him. I'm like these stupid little fish. Yeah. I'm like, I'm getting my butt whooped today. And I talked to a really good buddy of mine, Alan Ranson, who was owner of Strike King Lure Company. Um, and, and I vented to him and I'm just like, man, what am I doing wrong? I'm like, mentally, I know I can do this. I'm as good as Kevin Van Dam. Like mentally, I really felt I was there. I'm like, I know that guy can read the fish, read the environment, read the situations. And he's ahead of the game all the time. I'm like, I can do that. I've done that for the past 20 years in my career. Why can't I do that fishing? And Alan just goes, how long did it take you to get to that level in your military career? I'm like, you know, 15, 20 years. He's like, how long have you been professionally bass fishing? I'm like, at that point, like four. He's like, yeah. (laughs) You know how long Kevin's been professionally bass fishing? 15, 20 years. So, and I'm like, oh, light bulb. I'm like, okay, I got it. But I'm still frustrated. Like, yeah. I know I have that capacity. So it you can you can definitely be there and and you know but you got to put in the work, you got to put in the time and you have to learn and be in a bunch of different situations whatever it yeah. is, whatever your sport is, whatever you know your love is, your passion is. There's no shortcut. Got to hammer it. There isn't. There really isn't. I, and it goes back to like I I I can't ever remember who was the original person that I heard say this. I know it's come out of Tom Davin's mouth a few times but that <clears throat> the way you do anything is the way you do everything. And so like for you, who's, who's reached the, the top element of what your profession was, you have to do that in every other thing that you're like pursuing from a career standpoint. There's just no other acceptable answer for you mentally than the best. Like I have to be the best. And I think that that like says so much from a, like, what are you like a growth standpoint of like, figure out how to be the best. And then like, you'll, that'll transcend into other areas of your life and just make it a more enjoyable experience in general. Yeah. I don't know. I think, I mean, we we're talking about this earlier today. I kind of uh, subscribe to this idea that you have to pick two or three things that you're going to give everything that you have to at, and that other things that are a part of your life will necessarily have to not get the same amount of attention. You know, like I, I think that, and there's, I don't think that you can be at an elite level. I think you can be um, competent in a lot of different things, competent. You can be even professional at a lot of different things, but to be like truly elite at something, I think it takes, I mean, you look at like, you know, elite athletes or guys that did what you did. Any people that are at the top of what they do, they devote. I mean, how much time did you devote to fishing compared to what you were doing uh, in the military at that time? Like, did, right. did you spend as much time fishing as you did on the pistol or rifle range at that point? Mm, like actual I, I, I hours mean, measured? Close to, probably yeah. not as much, just because I'm already done with one career and I've already, you know, deployed a ton. So no, now I mean, to at be, that time when you were coming up in, in the unit. Right. And, oh, oh you know. yeah. I mean, when I was, when I, when I was getting out, so I, I, turn professional. I mean, I fished my first professional tournament. I was still in. Mm-hmm. So I was still active. I was still in um, when I quote unquote, you know, turned professional. Um, and and I was, I, I was putting in as much time as I could. Like I remember, mm-hmm. cause at that point I was working in our research and development section. So I, I kind of had a desk job, um, you know, I was working on night vision and all this other stuff for, for the guys. And a lot of times I was sitting at my computer and I'm like, oh, I got a tournament, you know, coming up in two weeks. So I'm like on the internet, you know, <laughs> yeah. and, I'm, and I'm researching lakes yeah. and patterns and different stuff. So, I mean, I did, I put in a lot of time, and, you know, to get to that level. So I, I did uneven knowingly, now that you say yeah. it, like all the effort and all everything that I did to get to the point I was in the military, I was, I was building that same machine mm-hmm. to do that fishing. But what I would say is, you know, after I got out and even now, like, you do, you have to almost pick and choose, you know, you, I mean, you got to be married to something. And if you want to be at the top level, you have to dedicate a lot of time, but 
we got to balance all that. You know, now I'm I'm so busy with running my tactical training company and fishing and, you know, doing stuff with Black Rifle Coffee Company and consulting and family and you know, we're building a new yeah. house and I'm uh, you know, you're so spread thin yeah. that it's like, yeah, my last There's tournament. Stuff you probably turn down cuz you know oh, yeah. you're not going to be able to put right. the effort into it that you yep. want to put into something that you're going to give any time to, yep. you know. Yeah, my last I tournament imagine. I just kind of showed up. <laughs> I'm like, no practice. You know, I mean, I got a couple days of practice beforehand, but then I even had to leave practice. Luckily, it was close to home. I had to leave practice one day and go home for something because I had to handle some other business. You know, and then I came back and, you know, fished yeah. the tournament and did had a really good day one. Um, day two, just, I mean, caught fish, just didn't catch the size I needed. But, you know, it was just one of those where I'm like, well, I'm just winging this one on all my knowledge and, you know, hope for the best. Yeah, but yeah, I just uh, you you do you got to put in all the time and effort. You got to build up to that point, you know, to be at the top of any game. Yeah, I just I, I it's something, and I the reason I bring it up is it's something I've really been contemplating a lot lately as far as how you allocate your time about the things that you're passionate about and how you come up with what you're going to allocate, like what are your passions and things like that. And I think about like, man, it's not you can't do anything just forty hours a week. Nothing's a nine to five, right? That you actually give a shit about. Right. It, you, you're going to give everything you have at that. And it's, I think I come across some of these people who are like, you know, I really want to be, have like a well balanced life and all this other stuff. I'm like, man, I mean, that I, I won't hate you for that, but like, I don't think that to do any, to be great at anything, you're a well balanced person. Right. You know, I don't think that. Maybe it's I'm tough. wrong. I don't know. It's tough. I mean, what are the thoughts on that? Right. Like, I don't yeah. know. I mean, I think each individual person is different. You know, some guys can balance two, three things very well. Some guys, it's like, no, I I, I need to gear down and concentrate on one, you know? Yeah. Um, so I think everybody's a little bit different. You just have to find, find your niche and, you know, your passion. Yeah, I think that jack of all trades, master of none statement is kind of bullshit, to be honest with you. Because I feel like you have to have multiple skills to be good at the, like, objective yep. of what you're trying to, to mm -hmm. be. Like you could just walk down the table and be like, you're uh, <clears throat> the editor. Like you, you have to be a good writer. You have to be a good copy editor. You have to, yeah. you have to be creative. Mm -hmm. There's multiple I'm things a, that you have to be good at in order to be successful, right? Yeah. And I'm a big believer in, so in uh, the range regiment, there's these things called the big five, right? You're especially really, you, you need to be good at marksmanship, at medical, you know, first responder stuff. You need to be good at mobility, at PT and... Like on the last one, right? Come now. on, land Jamie, out. help him out. Yeah. I, think uh, land I don't remember the big five. Yeah. Other than that, I think that was a that was a yes. new era thing. That was a McChrystal thing, was it? He's uh. the one that started that. But I I really attribute that over of like, okay, you need to figure out what are the five things that you need to be really good at, and that at any level, anybody in your organization needs to be good at. And so, like, even in coffee or die, I have like coffee or die core competencies. Like, everybody needs to know how to take good stills. Needs to know how to do video. Needs to know how to write. Needs to know AP style, and has to know their way around Photoshop. Just nature of the job. You have to know all five of those things. You have to be at least semi-competent at those things, right? That should be the standard that you train to. And then if you can exceed on any of those where you're really good at one or two of those, now you're an asset to your organization, you know? And I imagine where you came from in the military too, it's like, yeah, I need to be good at a lot of different things. And then I need to be really great at one or two. It kind of seems to me like you were really great with technology and you know, yeah, I, I love it. Tinkering. Yeah, I did. I, I geeked out on it. I mean, and part of that came from my, my ranger days. Yeah. You know, I... I was a commo guy when I was in Ranger Battalion. That was the only way I could get my Ranger contract. So yeah, I came in as a commo guy and and I loved it. I, I ate it up and technology wasn't a big thing. I mean, computers were really getting fairly popular. I mean, this I went in in 93. Mm -hmm. So, you know, old AOL came around shortly after that. Right. The old dial up yeah. and, you know, it wasn't a big techie era. Whenever you say dial up, do you hear the sound? I, I was of about that to make it, but I'm like, I'm gonna butcher you, like, that, oh yeah. you know. But I, I was oh yeah. about to do like, it. <laughs> if, as soon as you said dial up, like that whole that yep. noise that was associated with that, like immediately thrust into my brain. I just hear my mom telling me to get off the internet. She needs to use the phone. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> right. Yeah. Or you'd that's get booted right. off when somebody yeah. would call in when you yeah. were on the internet. Yeah. Oh yeah, then you had to oh, go through the whole process again. <laughs> uh, yeah, good times. Um, yeah. But yeah, I I did. I I love technology. Because like you've seen, you've seen a huge progression of tech 
from 93 yep. to you got out in I got into, out in December of 14. Is this, you're like inner like you're you're like is 20 year old Jamie like RTO in the Ranger Battalion? Does he just cry knowing how small and light radios are now? Yes. Yes, <laughs> because like, I'm not a big dude. Yeah. And every time we did anything, jump out of planes, humped, ruck, dude, I had that big old thing on my back. I had that big green tick and it was heavy. Yep. All the time. Yeah. All the time. Yeah, there was no getting away. When you guys were jumping assault packs, <laughs> yeah, we're going to jump today. Assault packs is the packing list. I'm like, you. Oh, don't look at me. Yeah, you yeah, see yeah, how yeah, big yeah, I am. Yeah. I'm the dude with the Skedco or the Gustav or the, like, whatever tall, long, oblong thing is. It's like, yeah. all right, Marty, you're going to be fucking third in the chalk and you got this big fucking thing we're going to strap to you. So you feel my pain? Uh, a little bit. But Somewhat. I didn't yeah. have to think with what I was carrying. It was like, I just jump. It was like, you had to jump that heavy shit and then be smart enough to know how to use it and like, you know, make comms yeah. and things like that. So I think you had it harder still. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I do. I love the tech. And then, you know, when I got uh, got to the unit, saw a lot of stuff change, you know, from my first Afghanistan rotation in 01 through to Iraq. You know, we really started to see technology starting to ramp up, um, kit changing. I mean, it was, it was a, it was, it was a great era for me to be there, not only for just the technology, but the kit, the gear, the tactics, the way that we just adjusted to every operation. And there were times even in Iraq, you know, I mean, we were, I did 10 deployments to Iraq from 03 to 2012. And just every rotation was different. It wasn't like, oh yeah, we're back at the MSS or, you know, we're always here and deploying out of here and doing Baghdad stuff. And yeah. we called it Baghdad SWAT, or, you know, early on. It was just hitting hard and full rattle battle, you know, green green machine, we also called it. Um, but there were times I was doing low vis stuff, you know, I mean, in between two Afghanistan rotations early on, I was in Bosnia. So I'm over on the border, like sitting in a cafe watching these freaking war criminals who, you know, it, at any moment, if they knew who I was, would have just pulled a pistol out or a gun and just drilled me right there and continued eating their lunch. Um, but you had to blend in, you had to do a different stuff. So um, it was kind of cool, just all the different missions that we did and, and the era that I was there, what I saw. This is, yeah. I think, an interesting segue point to what we were talking about for this episode, the idea of selection and selecting the right kind of person, you know? And we're t we, we just spent, what, 20 minutes talking about like these personality traits, right? Jamie, I'm like fascinated with the little bit you kind of toss about. You, you've been through a lot of different selection processes or school, schools, selection mm -hmm. processes, all that sort of stuff. And you've been cadre at uh, some of them. What is, when you, when you think about personality traits and the um, right, you know, finding the right person for an organization, any organization, mm -hmm. what are the things that you're thinking about? Yes. And before you say answer that, we, we just give the break, like you Signed up in 93. Yep. And then what was your progression after that before you got into the So yeah, came in and came in in 93 with a Ranger contract, went through basic training, went to Air went to AIT, because I was a combo guy. So I went to Fort Gordon for AIT, then went to Fort Benning for jump school, then RIP, Ranger Indoctrination Program. Now it's called RASP. Um, got to 175, did some schools and stuff, you know, in 175, um, then went to selection for the unit in 2000 made it there and then of course different trainings and different things inside the unit that yep. I did and then retired out of the unit in December 14 yep so that's kind of the yeah the nutshell down and dirty um but you know as far as what what I what I see and think you know it's it, it depends. You know, I mean, Ranger Regiment's a little bit different because most of the guys that are coming to Ranger Regiment are are younger. You know, you're 18 years old, right out of basic training or, you know, you're um, whatever they call it now um, for 11 Bravos, you're one station training or whatever it's called. What, OSIT, yeah. Yep. Um, so you're right out of that. You know, for me, it was a little different. Of course, I wasn't much longer in the Army. Like another 13 weeks was my MOS training. Um, but what they're selecting is is just number one, really, it's like, who can suck it up? When I went through, it was more about who can just suck, who can accept the suck the best. I mean, I, we were talking earlier, but no lie, one of the days uh, in, in RIP, they had us out in the field and they're like, all right, we need five guys to quit today. And they put us in this, they called it the, they called it, I think, the Indian thinking position. Can, can, we, can we say that? Um, but we were 
feet on the ground flat and you were all the way over, your hands were behind your back and you were on the top of your head, was on the ground. So the only thing touching the ground was the top of your head and your feet, right? So all that weight was there, blood rushing to your head, hands were behind your back. And we were in that position until five people quit. So did, you know, what was they, what were they selecting there? Was it just mass punishment, whatever? They needed five people to quit. But if you think about it, right, it sucked. Okay, they probably not can't do that stuff today. But they got rid of the five weakest minded people right then and there. They're like, we're, you know, mentally, whether they were going to keep us there for 10 minutes or 30 minutes. I mean, I think I want to say we were there for felt like hours, but probably 30 minutes, right? That, that we were in that position till, till the fifth person, fifth person was like, yeah, I'm done. I don't need this. I'm out. But if you think about it, those were the five weakest minded people. Like when they get in a crappy situation, because we all know through our careers, we've been in plenty of those where we just did not want to be there. This like suck factor is high. We didn't quit. You know, you're like, well, I'll get through this. At some point in time, I'm going to be sitting down somewhere and eating a steak and drinking, you know, whatever your drink of choice may be, but it's going to be better. Like it's going to get better at some point. So, you know, it worked. Um, they got rid of those, you know, those five guys and they were gone. So I, I think Ranger Regiment is more about the suck factor and just, you know, getting the right mentally minded um, guys or the toughest guys that you can in battalion because battalion life is is tough, especially as a private, you know, growing up in there. Um, unit selection is a little bit different. Um, it's it's physical, it's very mental, but it's a different type of mental. Um, I don't want to get too much into it, but it's, it, it is selecting the right guy for different situations that you may be in. Like I talked about, you know, in Bosnia, just being comfortable in situations where I may not be eating a steak and drinking a bourbon later today. I may be laying in the dirt, yeah. you know, bloodied yeah. up. I mean, you don't know, but it's like, well, hey, I think I could get myself out of this situation if that's what happens. I mean, you're thinking ahead and going, okay, this is the worst case scenario that could happen here. All right, how do I get out of it? What are my, you know, where are my exits? What is it? You know, I mean, you, 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 you have to have that right person without having all that training. You have to select those right people that are moldable to be able to learn those things. And, and the biggest thing I would say when you look at the right guy that I think is it's a guy that, I'm going to use this example, right? Uh, like has the force. I mean, that's what I relate it to. You the know, X where, factor. Yeah, I mean, like Luke, you know, Skywalker has got the force. Like he can see into the future what's going to happen and they're able to be proactive, not reactive. So it's very similar to that where you can multitask, you know, like a great chess player can think three, four, five, six moves ahead of what his opponent is going to do. I just want to take a that's second and acknowledge the fact that a unit operator just basically said you have to be like Luke Skywalker. <laughs> you got to, to be, be a Jedi. I think they're only Jedi. They're yeah, only recruiting. Jedi. Well, they're only Jedi. recruiting Jedi. Jedi. over here. Yeah. Yeah. Fucking yeah. Jedi. Yeah. Like, you must okay. be a Jedi. <laughs> For everybody that's currently in the army, make sure you put your lightsaber skills on your resume when applying to any of these uh, things. It's, if you're not getting picked up for selection, you don't have lightsaber <laughs> skills on your resume, there's, there's your sign. You did not hear what was just said. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I mean, have I said too much? <laughs> yeah, that's the that's the easiest way I can somewhat explain it. You know, I mean, other than the chess analogy, I think makes sense to anybody that may play chess or, or has seen anything where it's like, yeah, you, in order to be a great chess player, you're you're playing that game out as soon as your opponent makes one move. You already know all the different moves, what can happen. But you know, even in chess, it's like it's scripted that player can only make so many different moves because it's set on a board. Like when you're talking about missions and things I've done and been on and where I've been in the world, like uh, there are too many millions of scenarios that could happen in an instant. So, you know, it is, it, it's, it's being, and this was, so one of my, one of my uh, in, instructors when I went through the free fall course um, had basically summed it up and he's like, look, Whatever you were doing in free fall and things that we do, he's like, you need to be proactive and not reactive. If you're reactive to something, then you're already behind the timeline, you know. And 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 I even I use that analogy when I talk about and teach like uh, shooting stuff, like 
from concealed carry. You know, for a lot of people that come to my classes or, you know, everyday carry, that's kind of their main thing. Like, hey, how do I get better at shooting my pistol? But their situation is an everyday carry situation. And I'm like, look, don't get hung up on, you know, everybody's hung up right now on this like sub one second draw. And, you know, I got to get my pistol out and get on target and sub one second. Like I'm a man, right? I could do this. Who gives a crap? Like you could have a two second draw, but if you're a paying attention to your surroundings, get your face out of your damn phone, right? And pay attention to what's going on. You're already ahead of the power curve. So instead of now, I'm like, oh my gosh, there's bullets flying. Whoa. And now you're reacting to what's happening. You're like, whoa, this dude that just walked in here looks a little shady. He's reaching for something. You're already ahead of the power curve. So it doesn't matter if you have that one second draw. You're proactive in reacting, you know, in attacking that situation. So... Okay, I'm gonna get off my soapbox. <laughs> well, no, here, no. What, what, can I get some more of this delicious uh, yes. bourbon? Yes, bourbon you can. sidebar. So, uh, this is a very special bottle for you, yeah. It it is most definitely. So, I just that's so much. I just taught a class. You good? You oh talk yeah, I'm gonna pass this down. I just taught a class prior to coming here. Um, well, I was at actually at Shooter Symposium prior to coming here, um, which was which was an awesome time, awesome event. Um, I thank those guys for having me out there. But um, I was in Oklahoma teaching a, a pistol class. Uh, it, was kind of, it was a concealed carry. Uh, it was for, um, I'll, give a, I'll give a plug here. So CCW Safe, um, they, they're, they're a sponsor of mine. Uh, I've, I've known those guys for a while now. They, they hook me up you know, and take care of me on the fishing side, but I, I promote their stuff. Um, so CCW Safe is a concealed carry insurance um, and it's for anybody that's everyday carrying and law enforcement guys, but it, it protects you if you ever get into an incident. So if you had to draw your pistol and actually shoot somebody um, to protect yourself, your family, whatever, save your own life, they are there to protect you because we think like, Hey, I was in the right, like everything I did, you know, I, yes, I, I was in fear for my life. This guy drew a gun on me and I got the draw on him and, and, and took care of the situation. There are times that you may just get thrown in jail and then you have to fight and prove your innocence. So these guys will immediately launch like a team leader. So this team lead is a guy with 30 plus years of homicide um, detective work. So he's prior law enforcement, homicide detective with tons of years of experience. He comes right there. He is your man on the ground. He is then going and getting all the local lawyers. He's then getting a private investigator. Like he knows what to do and he's gathering all the intel he needs to plead your case. So the local lawyers know the DA, they know the process there for wherever you are, but they send a team out. They'll help you with bail and getting you out. I mean, they're going to be by your side with a lot of heavy hitting lawyers and the right team to make sure that you get through that situation. Cause no, nobody thinks about it. You know, you're like, Oh, I'm just carrying, I'm carrying a gun every day to protect myself. Well, what happens when you have to pull that gun out and use it? Like you just, you just killed somebody. You know, are you a, are you ready to fight your own case and handle this whole situation by yourself? No. Does anybody you know are they able to do that? It's like no. Well, I have a lawyer, but he handles my speeding tickets, or you know, that's not the dude that you want. So that's what these guys do. So anyway, they they had me up there. I was teaching a class with them, and two of my students, a couple of law enforcement guys that that came through my class, they knew I was a bourbon dude, and we got chit chatting on day one about my favorite bourbon. And uh, I have a few, but my top dog is is Colonel Taylor, is this E. H. Taylor, and um, they they brought me a bottle on on day two after we wrapped up and busted that out, and that is the unfiltered, uncut, like barrel proof, which I have never had. I've had their single barrel and their small batch, which is great, but this, and I'm like, this is epic. Like this, this is a big. This is a big gift. I mean, it's a big deal to me. So um, this is literally the nicest whiskey I've ever drank. Oh, it's awesome. Yeah, but I told him I was like, yeah, I'm going to you know hang out with Logan and, and the guys from Black Rifle Coffee. I said I love good bourbon, and I I don't keep it to myself. To me, bourbon is meant to be drank, and especially drank and and with great friends and um you know and share stories. So it's a perfect time to break it out. They were super excited. They're like, heck yeah! So it's good. Yeah, it's really good. Colonel Tell, uh, Colonel Taylor, to his credit, also wore a top hat. Apparently. And uh, if there's any indication of who can make a great whiskey, it's a man with a top hat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I wonder what he was a. I'm sure the story is on there why he was a colonel. Yeah, and what to he was be honest, like and, 
I, I wish I could be smart and tell you all about it, but I don't know. I stumbled across this at a tournament. So I was in upstate New York fishing a tournament, a BASS tournament on Oneida Lake. And I just went to a local little liquor store and I saw two of those cans on the top shelf. And they actually had it mismarked. They had a small batch and a single barrel. And the small batch was like 40 bucks in the single barrel, which is a better, higher, you know, yeah. more rare, was like 30 bucks. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, mm. okay, well, that caught my eye because they mismarked it. The can caught my eye. And then I'm like, Colonel Taylor? I'm like, come on, man. It's got to be good, right? There's a Colonel. So I grabbed it. I grabbed the, the single barrel. I should have grabbed both, but I grabbed the single barrel and uh, finished fourth in that tournament. I mean, had a really good, a really good tournament. Took home a good paycheck, um, but I killed that bottle. I mean, I was up there eight days, you know, pre fish and then the tournament. And so maybe superstition. I'm like, it might there be, might be I one. I might have one. I'm like, every time I go on a tournament, I'm like trying to find some Colonel Taylor. But I'm taking notes over here. Yeah. It's like, okay, get lightsaber, learn force. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Colonel Taylor whiskey. <laughs> These are the ingredients to success. You need to shrink about a foot and a half. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, get that second toe down. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, I was making fun of his second toe earlier. I, we were sitting at the table eating and I look over at him in his, in his flip-flops and I literally, I went like this. Like, I'm pretty sure that your second toe is bigger than my pinky. It is longer. Mine is pinky. exactly the same length. Psst. Kayla, did you know with Black Rifle Coffee's Coffee Club subscription, you can get fresh coffee shipped to you every month? Julie. What? You don't even have to go to the store. Whoa. You don't even have to leave your bed. What? Wow. How did you get in here? You might want to go ahead and join the Black Rifle Coffee Club subscription before one of these guys shows up at your place. As your pinky? Yep. Really? Yep. It's exactly the same. It's strange. Wow. Yeah, I know mine. It's not. Yeah. I think if your I think if your second toe is really long, you're more intelligent. Uh yeah, I'll I'll subscribe to that. Yeah. I bet you two would. I'm gonna have to argue that point. Yeah. I mean <laughs> there may be some evidence to the contrary, but I you just have like a very unique physical structure in general. Um, and I've always known you as like, you know, like you're, you're a very kind human, Marty Scovlin Jr. Like you're, you're, you're a good guy to be around. You're very happy go lucky. Uh, you have, you carry good positive energy. And then I remember we went drinking one night, uh, a few years back. It was in San Antonio and, uh, we did, we did a good job. We we went down to some speakeasies downtown. I'd be proud of you. you is, know, that, is that what you're saying? Tom yeah. Dye was born in the basement of Esquire Tavern. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we were like, we weren't ready to close the night down. And he went to some, you know, hole in the wall bar that two other people were in. And we started playing pool. And one of the guys in there that was playing pool, he didn't, he wasn't like harassing us, but like he was being annoying to our group to the point where it got on your nerves. <laughs> And and then he it started. It takes like a lot. Like I'm a pretty like it, I don't. I'm not. Yeah. Like a, a lot of booze or a lot of action from the other person. And I saw you. You kind of puffed chest at him after he like w- just would not get. The, and I was like, Ooh, I want. I would love to see like uber violent six five. You know. <laughs> Marty on his fourth Ranger deployment. Marty. Yeah, not, um, I would really like to see that. Like the guy, the guy in the history of, or, or what was it, Violence of Action? That that version of Marty. That would have been really fun to be around. Yeah, my um, my wife's got a good a few stories for you that she can tell you. Not that she, I'm not inferring that, <laughs> uh, but I mean those black times. eyes healed up pretty well, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> But no, you know, when it comes to family or, you know, close friends, as it were that night, you know, you get pretty uh, defensive and I don't think I'm quick to anger or anything like that. But I do think that um, I haven't, and this isn't a challenge to anybody, but I think that when you're this size, you tend to not get in a lot of fights. This is a, this, this piece of skin suit is a, a pretty good deterrent for a lot of sure. people. Yeah. And so I think a lot of times it is just like a little bit of puff of chest and stuff. And, you know, if it comes down to it, yeah, you know, I'll. I might get my ass kicked. I don't know, but it's. See, I know. usually try to find the biggest guy in the room. Yeah, That's I. My uh, go-to. 
Yeah. You know? I'm, well, a, I'm, a, I'm always a happy guy. Like, yeah. there's, you're also like Evan and you have that like Napoleon complex a little bit too, though. Don't get me angry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like no, he, I, you, I'm just, I'm happy. I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to be alive. Nobody's shooting at me anymore. Um, I've seen a couple like, you, you, know? you have like an intense desire to like conquer the world. It's not just like be the Every, best. It's like, everybody I, doesn't. Well, and I, no, I, no, they for sure don't. <laughs> yeah. Oh. I think that there's something to be said too, though, of where if you spend a period of your life where your job was to be violent, you know, where your job was to be violent, that sometimes maybe you either consciously or subconsciously try to even the scales a little bit sometimes. Not that I have a problem with violence. I think violence is necessary, right? It's like a, it's a fact of life, right? But I do think that sometimes you try to balance those scales a little bit or, or just be like that more well-rounded um, I, I don't know. I don't know what I'm trying to say. Right here. Well, well, but I think I like. I think being the bourbon's nice. kicked in. I think I like being nice, and I think I like getting <laughs> along with people. And you know, yeah, it's for me. It, it's the awareness that uh, quote unquote evil people will use violence to maintain and establish power. Mm-hmm. And the only, really, the only way to combat violence is to. Be violence. violent. Yep. With violence. Like that is the <clears throat> that is the conundrum we live in in our former professions. And um, I think you just kind of have to admit that that is the way of the world. And Big subscriber it, to Speed Surprise Violence Faction. And in total, right. yeah. Good we, way to live. It works. Yeah. I've yep. heard that before. Yep. A time or two? A time or two. There's actually a lot of people that don't know this, but that's the first three of eight principles of CQB. A lot of people hear Speed oh, here Surprise Violence of Action. Can you name all eight or are you going to get seven and then... Ooh, no, I couldn't name all eight now. Because the first three, I, Jamie, can you? I didn't even know there was eight. Yeah, there's eight. I yeah. know three. Yeah. Surprise, speed, and violence of action. Yeah. That's it. When you have those, you're flowing, you're dynamic. Yeah, yeah. When you lose one of them, that's when you have to pick something back up. So for bizarre. us, like that's when we would throw a banger or something. Yeah. So like, you know, you're clearing, blah, 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 blah. And then you hit a stairwell or you hit a long hallway. You lose speed. Right, because mm-hmm. those are slower. Like you just can't run up a stairwell because what you don't know what's at the top. So I mean, that's when you, if you're at night clearing white light, I mean, that's when you flip your nods down, right? Sneak and peek again. But then once you get to the top and speed picks back up, you know, and or you throw a banger. Now you've just picked up violence of action again, and boom, you can pick the speed back up again. So I mean, th- to me, it's just those three work. Mm-hmm. I, I honest with you, I didn't know there was those are the most. Those are, I mean, that's like, yeah. it's just like those are the most important three. Those are the three that you absolutely need yep. to know. But um, yeah, I just think it's always like an interesting trivia point of when you uh, had to, you know, like when I came to battalion, you have to, you have a, like a ranger knowledge packet, right? Like I'm sure you had it. I had so, my, your ranger handbook. That was yeah, it. yeah. You got your ranger handbook. It's in your pocket. We have the ranger seven. handbook. They're like, ranger handbook is for ranger school. Ranger packet is for being uh, in battalion. Oh, really? Know? Yep. And so that one, like one of those things that you had to know was the eight principles of CQB. And I, I don't remember all eight of them mm-hmm. at this point. But yeah, a lot of people say speed, surprise, violence, faction. Those are the most important three. But there actually is another five. I don't know. I just think it's interesting trivia. I Maybe think we need to Google that. Figure out what those are. I mean, I'm, I'm tr- intrigued no, now. I am too. I would. Yeah. I would like to know. Maybe it's a ranger thing. Yeah. They need a little more it's direction. It's a ranger thing. We didn't invent <laughs> Jamie. Everything's a You know what thing. it was? It was some, here it was what exactly what it was. It was some officer that decided he was going to make his mark in the world in regiment. And that was his, in, that was his <laughs> OER bullet. And he came up with five more principles to add to the only three you really need. <laughs> yeah. That was his mark. Because that's normally how it happens. That's exactly what doesn't happen in yeah. the Marine Corps as we would just like to use the KISS principle. Continuously. Yep, that's it. Yeah. That is it. We don't go past three of anything. Yeah. Oh, there's so there's one in 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 police, and I only learned this because of teaching like night vision classes to a lot of officers. In teaching, one of the other guys I teach with is is a law enforcement officer. And the first time that we sat down and looked through what he had been teaching already, he had this slide in there, and the slide said the OODA loop, right? Mm-hmm. O O D A, the OODA loop, and that's what this law enforcement uses. And I'm like. I go, what the hell is that? And he's like, oh, it's observe, orient, decide, and act. And I go, some officer thought of that. I go, that's shit we do every single day, right? And I I make fun of it in all my classes when I have that and I teach law enforcement guys because I'm like, think about it. Some officer put his mark on this and and decided he's going to tell you how you're naturally just going to think every day. Because the OODA loop, right? We're going to observe, orient, decide, and act. I walk into the kitchen, 
right? Or I'm walking into the garage and my wife is in the kitchen and I see her pulling the trash bag out of the trash can, which I forgot to empty that she asked me to do before I went to go fishing <laughs> or something. And she's pissed off. I have just observed, right? Oriented myself to the situation. I decided I'm leaving the freaking room because she's about to blow up, right? Because she didn't know I just walked in the door yet. And I act and turn around and get the hell out of there. I'm like, we do that shit every single day. But somebody had to put a fucking label on it because that's what they do. So the eight principles I, of CQB, I found them. I, okay. I love that you just talk shit on the OODA loop, by the way. That just like made my whole <laughs> night. So speed, surprise, violence of action, dominate the room, eliminate the threat, control the situation, check the red and the dead, and evacuate key personnel and equipment. It's too much. Yeah, that's Maybe why I'm, I'm down to three. You well, know? Well, yeah. What, yeah. what you need to do in this scenario is create an acronym. <laughs> there so is an acronym for it. <laughs> an acronym for podcasting. Oh, geez, yeah. Sit at the table, talk, have a producer. Create great content. Yeah. Content. It's funny. Yeah. I we probably come up shouldn't be in charge of coming up with that. Dude, we... Uh, that was terrible. I hate acronyms. Yeah. I, I, I hate was, labeling crap and naming crap. We were uh, working a little bit of CQB last night. Just we wanted to film film some stuff uh, for this Beyond Black stuff, and we just it's one of the most interesting elements of warfare and combat to me because it's just it's like it, to me it's kind of the pinnacle for these three principles that we're just talking about, like doing. Uh, a clearing operation in a confined space where you have to flow and move and communicate. Like it's everything has to go right as fast as possible. And you like your principles and how you flowed and work through it. Like it's so interesting and like immensely difficult to master. And it was just kind of it. I just nerd out on it a little bit because it's so fun to do. And Evan talks about it a lot. And I always just like perk up whenever he does and <clears throat> work in that, like eliminating the statistical probability of threat. But it seems like that's one of the most difficult tasks that you can possibly try and master. And to see it done really, really well is is beautiful in a way. It's like listening to Beethoven. It it is. I mean, it it's awesome. I love it. And I and I love I don't, I, I teach it only to like SWAT teams and stuff, like the guys that need to know it. Um, there's definitely, you know, haters, right? Uh, civilian guys that all want to know it and want to come to a class and take one. Like I, I just don't teach it to civilians. I just don't, if a guy wants to learn how to clear his house, that's different, you know? But for for civilians just to learn how to do dynamic CQB, I just don't. I don't see it there. There's a whole nother conversation. But anyway, right? Some people are going to hate on that. Well, um, I mean, it really is the most difficult. I mean, you think about these kind of uh, elements of combat, right? Like like the most base level 101 is just your basic react to contact, right? You know, like that's the most basic yeah, react infantry. React to contact, break contact. In yeah, all those field, basic infantry yeah, drills know, are easy. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then I think after that, it's like, you know, you go into like, okay, how do you do an ambush? There's only so many ways to do an ambush, right? That's a pretty, pretty straightforward thing. And then you start getting into these higher levels. And I think CQB, and I think there's levels to CQB too, because the way a conventional army unit does it, vice the way uh, a ranger does it, vice the way you guys did it is, I mean, I got, uh, we were talking the other night, um, my uh, first deployment, you know, I think rangers, they do a lot of CQB. It's, you know, mm -hmm. we train it more than, Probably anybody but, you know, our older brothers. Um, and I think, you know, that first deployment I went on and I got a chance, they came over and asked for a detail. It was uh, over at the MSS there. And they asked, you know, some guys from uh, your old unit came over and asked for a detail. And it was like, oh, it, they need us to go unload pallets again or something like that. So me being first deployment, brand new ranger, you know, I'd been in battalion for like fucking six weeks. They're like, Marty, fucking you and the other new guy go over there. And then also it was like, oh no, you need your kit and your fucking safety lines and your rifle. Oh, okay. What? All right. This detail Probably gonna have us do like be the dummy for their dog, their dog team or something <laughs> like that, right? You know that's happening. Put on the bite it. suit, big yep, guy. Exactly. Run. And then all of a sudden, it's like we're doing a fam on little birds and stuff, and they just needed extra bodies to go work through a problem or something like that. And we go and fly across the Tigris. Over, I think it was the Tigris on that side. Mm -hmm. Go fly across there and hit this like empty building, and I'm like a brand new fucking Ranger private and. 
you guys are going, I can't keep up. And I'm watching this. And you're, when you talk about like a ballet or an orchestra, like that's literally what it's like. It's so beautiful. And you're like, man, this is so much more efficient. It's, it's nobody else does it like this. Nobody else, you know, it, yeah. it, it's incredible, you know, and I, I literally couldn't describe it with words to yeah. how, it, it's, you know. But here, I mean, it is. Part of part of the the weeding out process in OTC is CQB. So when we go through and get to CQB, that's where we lose the most guys in OTC because that's where you have to have the force. Like you have to be able to multitask. You have to be able to think ahead because everything's happening so fast. Like we don't stop. The flow never stops. Where other organizations they come in, they move to their points of domination, mm -hmm. they figure out what they have, then where they're going next, and then they collapse and move there. We never stop. The feet never stop. Like you're running through the target the entire time, right? To dominate it as fast as you can, keeping surprise, speed, and bond action. So we, you have to be able to process information fast in order to do the CQB mm -hmm. the way we do it. And Tom Spooner actually summed this up the best way because, you know, when I was in Ranger Regiment, I didn't do CQB. I was a freaking combo guy. I watched the 11 Bravos do it, right? And I got in on some tape drills and they would, you know, show me some stuff, but I didn't do it. I never really? did. Really? That, yeah. That's not, it wasn't something just everybody did? No, no. Huh. No, because I was a combo dude. Like I was with the headquarters. I was with the, the commander or the XO. I, no, like they don't come in the target. They don't, you know, and so Is there that was no still need. the case? Uh, I would say they got a lot bigger by the time I get there on Camo medics and fisters learning it because there were so many situations where we'd end up in a in a block party in Iraq mm -hmm. where you're just there's too many buildings to clear and you need lotty dotty everybody yep. you know and I can see that definitely. and so they yep. definitely I think got more but did they get it to were they as proficient as like the line guys no right you know and that's that's where so we lose a lot of guys because it's very dynamic it it flows you have to be able to process. A lot of information quickly um, and multitask, you know, inside your brain of what's going on. But the other side of it is that you get, you, you, we get to keep guys working together on the same team for close to two years. Yeah. Where in Ranger Battalion, you're only going to get to a certain level because think about it, Marty. Every couple of months, you're getting a new guy on the team. So you get to a certain level working together as your fire team and doing CQB and you guys are rocking. And then guess what? Oh, we just got a new guy. You're all the way back here again. Yeah. You got to get that guy up to level. We get a guy on a team once about every two years and he's already coming out of OTC. So he understands how we do it, right? But he's still behind the power curve. Like you come out of OTC and you think like, oh man, I'm rocking. Like I'm flowing with CQB. And the first thing that I used to do that I got from my team leader when I was a 2IC, when we the, we get a new guy on the team, we go through and, you know, hey, all right, welcome to the team, bubble, you know, hey man, glad you got here, the whole nine. And the first thing, training thing we do is we go down to the shoot house and we do CQB. And the first thing I tell them is, you're going to be three or four man. Don't take a shot unless you have a shot completely wide open. This is a little different than what you did in OTC. And they are. They're just hanging in the back trying to hang on and their eyes yeah. get open. I'm, mine did when I first got to the team. I'm like, oh my goodness. I'm like, I thought we were fast, you know, in OTC. And it's like, these guys are flying because they've been working together for two years doing a ton of CQB. And I imagine a lot of internal SOPs and things that you just, that are internal to your team. Well, it's, your it's, what's kind of cool and unique is it's internal to a bigger group. It's not just the team. Because yeah. when we, when, when I would clear, like in combat, I would enter with my team, but there are two other breaches and two other teams. By the time we were done, I wouldn't have my team with me. It'd be like one guy from another team, two guys from another team, whatever. Because when you come in, right? You, the biggest thing is you, you come in, you clear, but then it's, it's 360 degree security and find work. There's always a door somewhere. There's somewhere to pull security. So if I'm clearing and I come through this room and another team's coming in from another way and I see like somebody from that team going over to that door and I see guys already going there, I'm like, okay, where am I closest to? Where am I going? So you're just jumping in a stack somewhere because the flow is just going. It's fast, it's dynamic. So you're just jumping in with whoever. So we all work together quite a bit and we just flow together. So, you know, you, you, there's not, I mean, everybody works the same. I don't say there's SOPs or anything. I mean, we, we, we do it all the same. You just jump into whoever and you just continue to flow and it just happens, you know, nice and fast and smooth, fluid. And that's how you, you dominate it's, it. But that, it's that's beautiful. Yeah, and that's dynamic. 
You know, and, and, and what's funny is talking to and teaching a lot of law enforcement guys now, when we do talk about CQB, the law enforcement guys are so hung up on pieing corners and slow, methodical clearing. And I, I have to explain to them like, hey guys, here's my viewpoint on it. Do you do dynamic? And 99% of them say, no, we don't. We can't, we're, we, we are not allowed to unless it's an HR, hostage rescue. So if they have a situation where they have to get in there, then they'll do dynamic. And I go, how much do you train it? Oh, well, we don't really because, you know, a chance of us doing, I go, well, you can always slow down, but you can't speed up. If you don't practice dynamic all the time, when you have to do it, you're absolute soup sandwich. Yeah. And that's when you have to, it's a hostage rescue. Like you got to get in there and now you're clumsing over each other. Two people trying to come in the door from the same direct, you know, opposite directions that don't work. So I'm like, you need to practice that. And the other side of doing the pieing, we we started doing some of that overseas for reasons, right? And we had ballistic walls. They're concrete walls inside all these buildings and mud huts and everything that are ballistic, right? They're going to stop bullets. Every single structure you have here in the United States is sheetrock, wood, little thin paper metal stuff. You're standing outside that door and you're like forecasting where you are. Yeah. And the right dude is just going to drop everybody yeah. outside that door because those walls don't stop bullets. So I'm like, get out of there, get through it, get in there, clear it. Even if you're a Jedi? Well, well there's that exception, but I haven't found any in law enforcement. Ah, okay. They're all of you. <laughs> <laughs> Young Padawans. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. I've never thought about the difference between the stuff that you'd clear overseas and the stuff that you would clear here. That's that's a huge that's a huge difference. Yeah, I never those, about those guys don't even think about it. And I mean, no. that's the first thing I explained to them. I'm like, okay, what are you guys doing? All right, hey, let's talk about this. And they're like, oh, yeah, light bulb. Because I'm like, what happens if you get one or two dudes that go down right by this doorway? Now you got to get up there to get them. And there's bullets flying through the wall. No, just yeah. get in there and clear it. Or just stay outside and call them out. Gas them. Shut the power off. You know, mm. I was like, don't even go in there. Like, I mean, the first rule, don't run into a firefight. If I don't have to go in there, don't go in there. Man, I yeah. remember when that started to be like, the call out started to become like a regular thing. And a lot of guys were butthurt, but like, oh, what the, you know. Yeah. It ain't like, sexy. They want to go get after it. It's the least sexy thing, but yeah. man, does it make a lot of sense. Yep. It makes it, a lot of sense, especially does. when you have the threat of S-Vest and things oh, like yeah, that. Oh, yeah, yeah. And that's why we started doing it. Is yep. that, you know, there were pressure plates and all kinds of different stuff we run into. But the downside to it is it gives them plenty of time inside the building to do whatever, you know, to either prep, to get to come out to fight, or, you know, to destroy stuff that you need, you know, when you're going in yeah. there. So it's it, it works, but it has its downsides too. Yeah, I didn't know there was like two different kind of mindsets in the LEO world for hostage rescue versus... Did you have that? Because you've done a hostage rescue or two. And like, was there two different switches? No, because everything we want, we right? just do dynamic. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we do... We, we do, got one speed. Yeah, but I mean, we do pie. It just depends on the situation. And, that, and that's the difference. Like, you've got to be able to read the situation, read the environment, and know when to slow down, know when to speed up. You have to read that individually on your own. Nobody is there to tell you, oh, hey, uh, we're going to do a call out on this one. No. You know, you start approaching and it's like, okay, eh, something doesn't seem right. You know, hey, let's let's just go ahead and call this one out. You know, we have, we have concrete walls all the way around this structure, like most of the homes in Iraq. Then you just sit outside there and the turps on the bullhorn, you know, come out, everybody. And even then... There's been many a times where there's still one or two dudes hiding yeah. in there, you know? And sometimes God it's- God bless those dogs that go in and <laughs> yeah, root them out. Send the dog first and with the yeah. camera and yeah, you look. I mean, it, yeah, we have all the tools that law enforcement pretty much has. I mean, some of the teams don't, right? There, mm -hmm. There's tons of budget issues and they're well, well, well way un underfunded. Yeah. There is no doubt. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I, I, that's where I, I really enjoy teaching those guys. I mean, I, I enjoy sharing all of my knowledge, everything that I've learned. And it feels that I'm giving back. You know, my dad was in law enforcement. He retired after 35 years. My grandfather was in law enforcement. My brother-in-law retired out of law enforcement. You know, I got a lot of law enforcement friends. I'm super pro-military uh, or pro-law enforcement. I love those guys. You know, they're, they're pro-military. Yeah, pro-military. No okay. <laughs> so bigger. Yeah. I'm pretty um, anti-military. <laughs> I'm anti-military, but pro-law enforcement. I don't support um, the troops worth a shit. Yeah. yeah, they don't support me. They don't, they don't do anything for me. 
But I, yeah, I, 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 I love teaching those guys. <laughs> yeah. That 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 we've had all had happen. I'm sure we got some good stories on on that. Yeah, there I was a little. There's a little ditty on YouTube called the Italian Job Video. Um, do you never, care? Never heard of it. No. Yeah. Do um. <laughs> yeah. That was that was um that was that was pretty fun. Um. Yeah. That was uh that was my first that was that was my first time. That was my first hostage rescue. Um, oh, it was. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yep, that was that was that was my first. Yeah, yep. I was actually on a sniper a recce team when that went down. Um, I had just left. Well, I left the salt team. Was master breacher for a little while, and then um, got pulled over to the sniper troop. And um, that's when Tom Spooner and I were on the same team together. Yeah, yeah Tom and I went through Sodic together, which was awesome. Uh, and then we, right after Sodic, we deployed, went to uh, Iraq and initially in Fallujah and then uh, come out of there and then got assigned back to the troop I just left. So back to an assault troop. And it was like, yeah, you guys are pretty much just going to be a fourth assault team. And I'm like, yes, I, I love, I love my sniper time. I absolutely loved it. But my heart was as an assaulter, you yeah. know, that's what I wanted to go back to. And I made it known like, Hey, I don't want to hang out here forever. I'm, I'm cool to do this. I enjoy shooting a long gun. It's fun. I enjoy the recce piece of it. Um, but yeah, that deployment, we got, uh, pushed back over to my old troop and, um, yeah, it was, uh, it was kind of unique how it went down. Basically, uh, a guy walked in and said he knew where those cats were. And we're kind of like, eh, I'm sure you do, right? Eh, whatever. Okay, hey, here's a camera and here's a GPS. Bring us proof of life. Very next day, the guy showed up with pictures of those guys and, you know, the GPS coordinate to where they were. And it was like less than 30 minutes. We were on helos, like flying in the middle of the day. multiple stories where they start with, so some guy walked <laughs> onto base with some intel. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then this happened. The Uday Kuse. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's human works, right? I mean, you, for all the bad guys out there, you know, you piss somebody off enough, then they're going to rat on you. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so this guy walked in, there we were, and then less than 30 minutes later on helos flying in. And um, it was, it was, it was a, it was awesome hit. Um, went down fast. I mean, it shows you there, yeah. you know, from the first bird touching down till we had the hostages in our control was like 17 seconds. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was cool. Went in, cleared. Um, funny part of that is it's on the video. I mean, it says we're Navy SEALs. We're here to get you out. <laughs> so I grew up in that 90s era, late 80s, you know, and I seen the Charlie Sheen movie. So Charlie Sheen, if you're watching. Um, yeah, so watched that movie and saw that line where they come in, you know, they're like MP5s on this hostage rescue and, you know, Navy SEALs are here to get you out. Yeah. And it, it crossed my mind. Oh, right? so it was, you got, you were calling out that movie line. I yes. always thought that it was just you guys taking a shot at SEALs. No, I was calling like, out that movie. Well, it was a shot at the SEALs too. Yeah, yeah. But it was, yeah. yeah it, was, it was me quoting that movie line. Gotcha. So as soon as I walk in that room and there was already a team in there, um, as I came in the building, um, the team was there with the hostages. So I, I flew down the hallway, went into another room and actually the guys that were guarding them grabbed them up. And um, yeah, when I came back and I walked into the room where the hostages were, I said that. I'm like, we're Navy SEALs, we're here to get you out. And everybody just started cracking up laughing, right? <laughs> that was in there, all my guys are laughing. Well, the funny part of that is when the hostages got back to their embassy and were being kind of debriefed and everything, they asked, they were like, hey, who are those Navy SEALs that rescued us? And the people in the embassy were like, what? Yeah, yeah, they said they were Navy SEALs when they came in the room. <laughs> Of course, that got back to us and we were chuckling our ass off again. That's so you know, awesome. I was like, ah, that's funny. <laughs> yeah. So I had to put that in the little video. But yeah. 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 So I did. I did a little video. Um, just put it together for the guys because I was wearing a helmet cam at the time. And um, it ended up, I got told to put it on the computers there, you know, where we were. And somebody pulled it off of there and leaked it onto the internet. It got pulled off the internet then it got put back on. And then they were just like, yeah, whatever. Nothing ever gets the recruiting tool removed guy. from the internet no. these days. Before no. it made it to the internet, two years later, Private Scovlin came across it on computers overseas. It was like, holy shit, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. Who the yeah. fuck are these guys? <laughs> like, you want to talk about inspiring material? That was like, hold, this is fucking awesome. It was so cool. 
As I would, when I found out that you were one of the guys on that, you know, I think Jamie or uh, Jamie, um, Ethan Nagel was told me, I think you just got done shooting your presents. He's like, yeah, man. He's like the guy that was on the fucking Italian job. I'm like, get the fuck out. Are you kidding me? Like, like basically like meeting Chris Pratt for me or something, you know, yeah. from Michael Jordan. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Pretty fucking Speaking cool. of Chris Pratt. Dude, Chris Pratt, where let's you go at? fishing, man. What I mean, like he fishes. He loves to bass fish. I've He's seen a huge it, outdoorsman. Honestly. Yeah, yeah. And I've I've tagged him in a bunch of my Instagram stuff on my JC Pro Angler, like my pro fishing page. And I've tagged him a bunch. Like I started a, a deal because I saw all these all these guys like tagging these celebrities and taking them to their Marine Corps ball and all this. And I'm like, maybe this will work, and I can get Chris Pratt to come fishing with me. Like I don't want to take him to the ball. I want to take him and go have a ball and go catch some big old fat big old fat fish. So I tagged him for a while and other people that were following me were tagging him like, yeah, Chris, you need to go fish with this dude. Like he's a real Avenger, you know? Oh, whatever. We were goofing on it, but Chris, you never reached out to me, man. I'm kind of upset. So I'm I know, upset on Jamie's behalf. I know you follow Black Rifle. So let's yeah. go bass fishing, dude. Yeah. Dude, he's, he's the lead on the series for Jet Cars Terminal S coming out on Amazon. So, oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we need to hook this up. He's James Reese. He is, yeah. Yeah. Pretty yeah. cool. You know what it was kind of cool that won me over with him, the, like his range on stuff? I mean, we're going off on a totally different fucking topic here, but he played a fucking seal in that Zero Dark Thirty movie. And it's like, oh man, he played the fuck out of that. I can totally see him as this yeah. like, James Reese type, you know? He could totally pull that off. Yeah. Oh. Did Pretty you cool. see the new movie he did? That, um... Tomorrow War? Tomorrow War. It was, yeah. It was pretty good, man. There I, was I, not one reload in that entire movie. <laughs> reloads Did you guys are, do a pick apart yet of that one? Or we reloads have it, are yeah, veterans. Yeah, yeah we veterans haven't on reacted tomorrow. to it. I, I've seen some really funny commentary on the firearms used in that. And because it, it's, it's but basically. It's the future. You don't have to do reloads in the future, man. Well, no. well, it's also it's the future, and you think we would have something better than just a black gun? Yeah. Well, black just rifles are pretty awesome. They are awesome, but you like. I hope that fifty years from now we just have something that's. We're gonna have lightsabers, dude. Lightsaber. We're all gonna I want, be Jedi. I want a lightsaber gun. Mm -hmm. Shoots lasers. I if like you it. get a kill with a lightsaber, does it count as a knife kill? No. 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 Mm. That's like saying if you get a knife kill, does it count as an e tool kill? No, it's in a separate category. <laughs> e tool kill. That's a thing <laughs> for yeah. Marines. Yes, and MRE they always kill. Yeah. <laughs> Is there okay? Here's another one. Yeah. Is there a difference between a knife kill and a bayonet kill? I think so. Yeah. 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 There. You, yeah. He's setting you up. There because absolutely the, because the bayonet is on the end of a, a rifle, knife. which a basically knife, is sure. like handling a but lightsaber. As a part of the rifle, it's a different weapon system. So I just want to, for our audience, we need to set this in stone, establish precedence here. If you're going to claim a knife kill, it has to be knife in hand. Does it matter if it's fixed or folding blade? Nope. Okay, fixed or folding blade. Knife in hand cannot be attached to a rifle, cannot be electronic or Jedi in nature, must be <laughs> made of some sort of earth material. What if the guy's earth, a Jedi? Earth Does that change things? <laughs> yeah. Gavel strike, it is law. It is, make it so. Uh, I like where this is heading. Yeah. Well, we're doing we're, important work over Well, we're yeah. getting into like your territory a little bit. Is like, what are the, is there any like crazy, crazy stories that involve? weapons or implements that are not normally used in combat situations. I once killed a man with a pencil. Did you? No. Wow, John Wick. I did not. No, I am no John Wick. Did he kill your dog? I hope not. <laughs> I love my little new puppy. I got a new puppy. Dude, there was... I'm a, I'm a little bit of a movie buff, and not to discredit your, your puppy story, but... Um, so... Nicholas Cage just keeps making movies and they're, you, you don't even hear about them. And then just all of a sudden there they are on demand. And there's one uh, that's just called pig. And it's, it's, I don't know when, what time period it's set in, but basically Nick Cage has a pig and he uses it to forage and find truffles in the forest. And someone steals his pig and then he goes on a rampage to get his pig back. And I'm like, that, what is going on in Hollywood right now that this is the stage run where we're taking the John Wick concept and we're doing it with Nick Cage and, and a pig. pigs? 
Hollywood's digging right like, now. Like this is yeah, we we just need to start making more movies cuz this is getting ridiculous. They've run out of topics. It's official. They've reached the end of the movie list. It's like reaching the end of the internet. Marty's like, I loved that movie. Yeah. <laughs> I had never <laughs> seen it. I didn't know it existed. Nicholas, but now I, I realized about no, I must watch it. into your talk about this that you didn't like the movie, and that really broke my heart. Because I, I, I thought I, we were going to talk about how we both loved that Nicolas Cage pig movie. I didn't watch it. <laughs> I, just, I just saw the trailer, and I was like, no, I can't do that. I can't think of the names of movies that I really hate because I hated them so much. I blocked their titles up, but there's like a few movies that you occasionally come across that you think that they're going to be really great and you and you really look forward to watching them and then you watch them and they're just so utter dog shit that you just, it just infuriates you that you but what wasted movie, any time. So what movie have you seen the most? Um, the most ever? Yes. Probably that you've movies. rewatched. Rewatched and rewatched. Probably the Goonies. The Goonies? Yep, for sure. The Goonies is a classic. Probably The Departed. I'm a, that's probably my n- number one. If you had held a gun to my head and was like, pick your favorite movie. Fun fact, that's yeah. the first date I ever took my wife on. It was Departed. I was like, Sean, she's from Boston. This Departed movie's in this movie theater. I don't know shit about Boston, but like, hey, so you see that Boston movie? You're from well, Boston. Why don't you let me take you to the Boston movie? You should be superstitious about that and like watch it. Every anniversary or uh, we've something. We've seen it. I mean, we've rewatched it a couple times. Like Matt Damon coming in at the end there with the the you know surgical fucking suit on and everything like that. Like that's pretty fucking gangster. Like I, that was pretty cool. Yeah, that was Marky you know, Mark. Oh, was that Mark Wahlberg? Yeah, no, he kills he Matt, killed Damon. Matt Damon. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> For those that haven't Oof. seen it. Sorry. Yeah. Whoopsies. It's yeah. like the no. very end of the movie. Actually, <laughs> you know what probably competes with the Goonies for no me need is to watch Dumb it and now. Dumber. Like Dumb and Dumber. Oh, I've seen yeah. Dumb and Dumber a fuck ton. Uh, there are some definitely classic. MacGruber like, humor. is my favorite comedy movie of all time. Really? Yes. Even also over like- Joe, Joe Dirt, man. Joe oh, Dirt. Joe Dirt. Yeah. Oh my yeah. gosh. I've seen that, that a ton. That surprise me. Joe that, Dirt. That, just, it kills me. school a lot. Old, Old school, school is yeah, really good. good. I remember yeah. we were sitting in uh, like the holding bay in, um, I can't remember. We were like, we were somewhere in Europe waiting to take the final flight into Afghanistan. And they were playing, you know, we were in a huge holding bay and they're just throwing a movie up on the big screen. And it was, it was like so somber. And uh, they played Talladega Nights and it was the first time I had seen it. And everybody's just like stone quiet, and I'm just laughing my oh, yeah. ass off. How can you, how can you, how can you not? Movie? Yeah. Like, Sweet just baby me. Jesus, bald baby Jesus, <laughs> <laughs> laying there in your diaper. <laughs> like, <laughs> so I can watch pretty much any Will Ferrell movie and be very entertained. Oh, yeah. Like, even if it's like the 15th time I've watched it, I can. Will Ferrell's a funny guy. He cracks me up. Yeah. I want to. Put some M and M's on some spaghetti noodles and drizzle it in oh, chocolate oh. syrup right now. Just listen to you say that. We watch Elf every yep. Christmas. Every it's year. on multiple times. Yep. Yeah. Every year. It's a classic. That's like a if we have yeah. any traditions in my family, it probably is watching Elf during the holiday season. Like yep. we don't. We're not big on tradition. We fucking watch Elf every year. Yep. Every year. That's us. Yeah. That's a that good. and a Christmas story. Yeah. Christmas, Christmas vacation story, is. Yeah. Uh, the day after Thanksgiving, mm. our family gets in the holiday spirit by watching Chevy Chase. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I'm more. Of, I I, I kind of sign with Jamie on the uh, Christmas story. That's yeah, classic. classic. It's a super <laughs> classic. It's a classic. This has been a classic podcast. I think it'll live in infamy as long as people listen to podcasts. I don't think podcasts are going anywhere. No, they're not. Yeah, that was a good one. Dial up one away. We're here to stay. Jamie Caldwell, like thank you for joining us. It has been an awesome time the last few days. Mark Scovland, a pleasure as always. Always, yeah. Yep. Thank this you. Is the Black it was Rifle awesome. Pof- this is the Black Rifle Coffee Podcast. Thanks for that bourbon. Yeah, let's do this again. <laughs> That concludes today's training. Any questions?